Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Joel Hunter here, here to discuss with you consequentialism. This is the second video on consequentialism, and today we're going to talk about some of the difficulties with this normative theory. And so let's get right to it. If you need to look at um, the attractions of consequentialism, you can just check out the previous video. Um, it would be covering chapter 9 in our text, the Russ Schaefer Landau text. Um, and in that, we go over what are the, uh, the, the nature of consequentialism and its uh, attractions, its benefits. And we'll touch on a couple of those things where they come up again in today's uh, video. But first thing we want to do is we want to look at the, uh, the issue which you may have, uh, which may have occurred to you when we were talking about um, trying to uh, uh, determine what is the uh, optimistic action. In other words, what action is going to maximize overall well-being when we were talking about utilitarianism, okay? And if utilitarianism is true, then the right action is the one that brings about the greatest overall well-being. And you may then very rightly ask, well, how do we measure well-being? So this um, you know, implies that there's some sort of quantity of well-being, and this is a you know, like you can assign a number, uh, a numerical value to different kinds of well-being, uh, different intensities of well-being, or the number of individuals uh, who um, whose well-being is increased. Um, so there's numbers of way, a number of ways you could measure well-being or try to measure well-being um, but then there is uh, the, the deeper issue which is um, that there might be many things that contribute to well-being and so uh, for example if um, one is maybe a good you, you could say oh we can measure happiness okay um, which is going to increase or decrease, which action will increase uh, happiness more than another action. But what about autonomy too? Remember that's a possible intrinsic value. And so how do we compute that, uh, uh, what autonomy contributes to well-being, for example? And then there are any number of other things. And then on the, on the negative side, of course, you can look at the things that uh, are intrinsically bad um, and you know different kinds of say physical pain uh, different kinds of mental anguish for example um, so we have then a plurality of, of things that can contribute to well-being or to misery and then the question is well how do you actually come up with this computation so the argument that comes from trying to do this, and one, by the way, one, uh, uh, one way to, uh, one qualification, I should say, that John Stuart Mill provided to uh, utilitarianism was by looking not just at the overall quantity of happiness, um, where dif the different qualities didn't matter, uh, to actually adding into the quality of the happiness that, and making that matter. Um, so uh, we want to maximize, according to Mill, not only the quantity of, of our happiness, but also pleasures, but also the quality of those pleasures as well. Um, and then, uh, but still, the problem of value measurement is still going to be present. Um, so if we are, especially when we're talking about just a single intrinsic value, because it comes, you know, it, happiness comes in so many different flavors. Um, there's the, the happiness of the sort of momentary elation. You can get a, a bit of good news, surprising good news. Maybe there's that, and then there's the happiness of sort of steady contentment, uh, of tranquility that is, uh, uh, not easily disturbed, maybe the happiness of physical excitement, uh, maybe the happiness of a mental challenge and overcoming it and succeeding at it, 
maybe the happiness of, um, of, of gratitude, of certain kinds of, um, of virtuous feelings. Okay, you can come up with so many more things, right? And then the question would be, what common measure is there to all those different kinds of things that result in happiness? Just And just taking happiness as a single intrinsic value. Okay, so then here's an argument that you know, comes from this sort of uh, reflection. And that is utilitarianism is true only if there's a precise unit of measurement that can determine the value of an action's results. Uh, premise 2 says there is no such unit of measurement, therefore utilitarianism is false. Okay, so it seems like premise 2 would be something that all would agree on. It seems the most plausible of the two premises, and most utilitarians would probably admit that premise 2 is true, there's just not a precise unit that can measure happiness or, in more generally, well-being. And so they've got to push back against premise one. Um, so they're, they're asking us, after all, to compare different actions on the basis of which one maximizes well-being. Okay, so when, you're, when you are comparing two things, you know, we have terms like taller than, or faster than, or wealthier than, all of those things come with units of measurement, right? So, you know, she's talking about taller, she's talking about units of length, right? You have, uh, you're talking about who is, uh, if you're talking about faster than, you're talking about a, a unit of speed. If you're talking about wealthier than, you're talking about, you know, units of dollars. Um, of money. So all of that can be done precisely. So that is what makes premise one look quite appealing. Um, it seems like that there are clear cases where some actions create more overall benefit than others, even if you can't quantify those benefits. Um, and there are examples that your author discusses there. And then you can do the same thing with harms, right? There's um, all kinds of harm, um, you know, that can occur, all different um, what, it, intensities and scopes of harm that can occur in different situations. Um, and it's clear enough when some are worse than others. Um, and, and that is probably enough to cast doubt on premise number one, for example, just to, for example. So let's take, you know, let's say there's a refugee camp and there's a dysentery outbreak. We have, that is, and you know, that is uh, such a, a huge health risk and health problem. Um, it's easy to see how that harm is more significant, is is greater than the harm of, you know, the um, uh, you know, maybe a family squabble where there's a fight, maybe harsh words are exchanged, something like that. Um, so it's easy enough in those kinds of comparisons of things to uh, to see that premise one, you know, can be rejected. Um, so sometimes, you know, you can actually do steps one and two of the argument, um, but. Uh, but it isn't, I'm sorry, steps one and two of determining the intrinsic, uh, uh, overall intrinsic good and overall intrinsic bad. It, the problem comes, however, when you are trying to compare the benefits and the harms and then find the greatest balance, you know, the, the optimific action from the, uh, the net, greatest net overall balance of good, of well-being. Um, and that's where, uh, the ratio of benefit to harm being as great as possible, um, you know, we have to remember that it is, you know, it's not always going to be the action that produces the greatest amount of well-being. Um, it's not going to be the action that benefits the greatest number of people. Okay, so um, 
it's easy, uh, you know, so for utilitarianism, there, there are a great number of actions where it will work because it's easy enough to see where, um, on the principle of utilities terms, the, the right action uh, would be, you know, and I gave you that example of, uh, of you know, of measuring different harms and different goods. Um, so, you know, if you have, for example, in your list of choices of uh, actions, an action that has no chance or very little chance of improving any, any well-being at all, then obviously you don't do it, right? Um, but these are the easy cases, and the problems in the real world tend to not be that simple. Um, it can be very unclear which action is the optimistic. And that's not even because we're ignorant of the results. Um, it's, it comes down to that question of measuring the benefit and the harm involved. Uh, and so that is uh, uh, one of its advantages, one of utilitarian's advantages was it gave really clear and concrete advice about what to do in complex situations. But with this argument, uh, or this problem of value measurement, that, <coughs> sorry, that um, now comes into some doubt. <coughs> um, okay. Next, uh, the next issue, and I like this one because uh, you know, the, the, the ethical demands of utilitarianism, and I, I mentioned this in the previous video, uh, are very, very high, and some would see that as um, a, that would be that would count for utilitarianism that it is ethically demanding but uh, your author introduces this as to one of its difficulties so just because it is demanding doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong and you know plenty of people reject ethically demanding uh, ways of life and systems uh, of thought um, because they are demanding um, but that doesn't that doesn't strike against it not being true, and so you just have to uh, realize what this objection is about, and so you know we have to we have to qualify what we're saying here. We're, this if this even if utilitarianism is too demanding, that doesn't make it false. Okay, uh, what could make it false are some of the specific demands that are required, and we'll get to those. Okay, first of all. One of the areas where it's very demanding is deliberation. It seems like we have to do a lot of thinking, uh, a lot of weighing, a lot of consideration um, before we act. And that, when we talk about uh, real world kinds of decisions, that would seem to complicate making, uh, uh, taking action and making decisions if we are uh, attempting to um, uh, take in all the information that's needed in order to evaluate, you know, the, for the optimistic choice. Uh, do we even, even if we had uh, the unit of measure from the previous objection, could we calculate it in a timely fashion and act? Sometimes, you know, we uh, we must act and act quickly, almost instinctively. And so there's this problem in that deliberation, so much del deliberation being required to act morally um, introduces them. Okay, uh, motivation then. Uh, it seems like um, that our motives will have to be um, always benevolent and always selfless. We can't, uh, we can't be um, <clears throat> constantly looking out for ourselves. We can't look out for ourselves really at all. Um, we have to be about as altruistic as it's possible to be. Um, we, it's not that you have to, it doesn't mean that you always have to be thinking about how you're going to improve the world. Um, you know, you. We, we've uh, talked about this in previous videos, is that when, sometimes when you're so single-minded in a specific aim, as noble and as good as it may be, uh, <clears throat> so often that backfires and you end up creating more misery than happiness. 
Um, and so the, <coughs> excuse me, so the motivation then comes, uh, becomes then, uh, uh, the issue comes down to how saintly one has to be to implement, to act always in the optimistic way. Um, and so what consequentialism provides us is a standard of rightness, um, not a decision procedure. So what we have there, I should define what those are. In fact, I think I've got a slide. Let me just cheat ahead here. Yeah, I've got that. So I'll go into that in just a bit. Um, I'll just set this aside, this issue of motivation here beside for a second. Um, so let me see how, how I want to move on to the next thing here. Um, <clears throat> I think I've said what I needed to say so far. We'll come back to it in just a second. Okay, action. So the third problem, the third uh, issue that is very demanding is uh, you, um, uh, even if, okay, you, let's look at the first two, even if you don't have to deliberate to do, uh, to always do what is optimistic, let's just, grant that utilitarians can come up with a uh, you know a way around that problem uh, and even if you don't always have to be a moral saint we can get around the motivation problem uh, then we come up to this third problem um, you really do have to act to achieve the optimistic result uh, you there is no getting around that in utilitarianism so whenever you fail to act uh, optimistically, you are behaving immorally. And that seems extreme. That seems possibly excessive. Uh, it seems to require constant self-sacrifice. Um, and then you can think about then, you know, with, if that were the case, you know, what are some of the consequences of that um, on, on those near you, especially? Okay. Um, and there's some good examples here. Dr. Paul Farmer is discussed in your text. Really great. Uh, if you uh, don't have the text, then you know, look up this uh, story about Dr. Paul, uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, um, who was a, a Harvard uh, a Harvard professor, co-founded Partners in Health, a nonprofit. Um, really fascinating story, but uh, in some ways a, a very sad story. Um, so. The, um, um, you know, here's the, here's the sort of irony, I guess, is that you're given the individuals who are in positions of influence and power, uh, wealth, and so on, more is, more is required of them, morally speaking, than, say, an average person, um, because the, the self-sacrifice will be so much greater for those individuals uh, who have a lot, what, whatever that lot is, money, power, uh, um, influence, and so on. Okay, so that's, a, that's an interesting, uh, possibly ironic consequence of utilitarianism. But then there's another uh, another issue here, and it gets to this term that I need you to know, supererogation. Uh, so an act is supererogatory if it goes above and beyond the call of duty. Okay, you've heard that phrase before, I'm sure. So, uh, the, yeah, the technical term is supererogatory. So the uh, what utilitarianism, though, says is that hey, there is no such thing as supererogatory acts. If it is an act that... Uh, is the best that you can do, uh, then that's what you do. That is your moral duty. And so there is no going above and beyond uh, one's duty. You, it's always one's duty to do the best that you can do in every single, every single decision, every single act. Um, so, you know, rushing in to uh, rescue somebody from a burning building, um, that is not going above and beyond the call of duty, but if that is the, um, you know, to rescue those strangers uh, trapped in the building, then it is not supererogatory. It is instead 
well, that's the optimistic choice, assuming you know other things being less uh, less beneficial overall. Okay, so that is the the demanding part of um, of utilitarianism, and it is highly demanding. Now I want to jump back to a couple terms that you need to know um, with respect, especially to motivation. Okay, so. Keep in mind the difference between a decision procedure, which is a method that allows you to reliably make the right decisions about what to do, and a standard of rightness that tells you under the, the conditions under which actions are morally right. Okay, so utilitarianism is a standard of rightness, not a decision procedure. Okay, so what that means is you can't get around the, the need to do something like the deliberative part, to do the, the computational part of determining uh, the overall uh, well-being, uh, the net balance of, of good, as opposed to uh, the net balance of good and you know, weighing the, the, overall, um, uh, the overall good against the overall bad. You can't get around that. So what decision procedure um, do you have? Well. Utilitarianism doesn't really provide you one. They, they, t they give you the standard of rightness, and then that decision procedure uh, for reliably making the right decision is, uh, you know, is, uh, is not available in utilitarianism. Okay, so um, and these and the two th so the two things don't go together, and the text discusses how the principle of utility is not. Uh, Good as a good dis, um, decision procedure. Um, okay, so it'd be why is that? Well, because it'd be a very unusual situation if you can ask yourself whether the act you're about to do is optimistic or not. I mean, we don't act. Uh, we usually do not have the uh, luxury to be able to uh, do that uh, and to implement um, a decision procedure that tells us. That requires us to determine the optimistic, uh, the, the optimistic action that we're about to do, or the the degree of uh, um, what am I trying to say? The whether it is in fact optimistic, the thing that you're about to do. Okay, so that uh, completes then what I wanted to say about motivation. So it doesn't uh, um, it doesn't give us um, I think I've said all I wanted to say about motivation. Um, you, whether you feel it or not, what utilitarianism requires of you is constant benevolence. Um, you never take a moment or two for yourself. Um, that is what is required of you. Um, so you, um, so your motivation then is. Um, is something that cannot be. Uh, uh, you don't get a day off, I guess. <laughs> is that one way to put it? Your motivation will always be maximizing the the uh, overall benefit. And so, coming back to the definition for constitutionalism, it's uh, 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 acting in such a way that increases uh, the uh, well-being in the world. And so, yeah. Sometimes that'll include you, sometimes it won't. So looking out for number one is not uh, possible in utilitarianism. Okay, so um, impartiality, if you saw the previous video, you know that impartiality is one of the attractions of utilitarianism because it regards everyone's uh, interest um, and, and moral status as equal. So that's good. I mean, fairness and equity, good. No one is more morally important than anyone else. The downside is that no one is more <laughs> morally important than anyone else in, in your life. And so that seems to run against some interests that we typically have and that our, our uh, moral intuitions are, are that it's um, 
certainly morally acceptable, if not morally required, to uh, give uh, priority to our loved ones and to friends than it is to our to than to total strangers. And so there are examples uh, in the text of this. So that uh, that issue is um, is one that is has uh, it's interesting. Impartiality works both ways with uh, consequentialism. It bo has both a, a positive uh, feature as well as a, a negative feature. And so what we have then is that um, uh, in the next problem is the, uh, the, the remember we have in, uh, in consequentialism, we, we look at what is intrinsically valuable, uh, what is uh, good in and of itself, and we look at what is intrinsically um, uh, bad, what is uh, you know, in, uh, uh, of, of its own, uh, of its own, not good, like physical harm, things like that, physical pain. But that doesn't, even though utilitarianism, it, you know, incorporates into it this uh, 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 measurement of those values, it doesn't incorporate in it any intrinsic rightness or wrongness. Uh, it only, the morality of the action doesn't depend on any kind of intrinsic rightness or wrong. Like, you know, keeping promises. It's always right to keep promises or do not lie about others, th that kind of thing. Um, the morality of the action always depends and entirely depends on the consequences. So there's no action that's intrinsically wrong in utilitarianism. Any action can be justified in the right circumstances. Uh, even the worst possible actions you can think of, like gratuitous murder, uh, gratuitous torture, things like that. Um, and yes, they would be rare, obviously, but there is, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with such actions. And that is, um, um, that seems to strike, um, strike us as a, tr as a problem. And, and maybe a flaw in the theory. Um, you know, for things that are intrinsically, that we would tend to take as intrinsically right, as, such as always keeping promises, um, you know, kindness to others, telling the truth, um, you know, it's possible for those things to be immoral. They would be immoral if they fail to be optimistic. Okay? And that's, again, that is a, a result here of there being no intrinsic rightness or wrongness in utilitarianism. It's the morality of the action will always depend on the consequences. And so, yeah, it can, <clears throat> it seems like um, uh, there are um, plenty of situations where the um, uh, a cruel and unjust leader can justify um, horrific and immoral acts on the basis of, well, the alternative would have been much worse if I hadn't done, you know, if I hadn't tortured my opponents, if I hadn't uh, brought out, you know, the National Guard to crush the Civil Rights March, then there could have been all kinds of shenanigans that would have been worse than yeah it wasn't it wasn't great it wasn't good but it's better than what happened so there are all sorts of ways that um, this this problem in utilitarianism can introduce um, you know these kinds of false justifications where it's not that they are isn't and it isn't that they would be that such an individual would be um, actually implementing a utilitarian principle it is or acting on utilitarian principles it is that they're trying to justify their own um, self-interest and 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 their own ruthlessness okay so <clears throat> that gets us actually to I think this might be the final um, the final issue and it's a big one and that is the uh, problem of injustice so 
here's the argument, um, and I'll come back um, and mention a couple uh, examples that are important. And the wartime examples are often helpful here. And your text goes into one um, that uh, General Sherman, what something General Sherman did. Um, it's a fictionalized account of um, his uh, march to the sea uh, through Georgia, and and what happened, you know, as a result of some guerrillas uh, from the south um, harming some of Sherman's soldiers, and what Sherman did in response to that, which was to execute somebody, uh, a prisoner of war, um, you know, who had not undergone any kind of trial. As far as they know, he didn't deserve to be to to be killed. So anyway, um, the it seems like in uh, in that particular case that hey, look, um, it's the right thing to uh, ignore this prisoner's moral rights because we can save more lives as a result. Um, that would be the right thing to do in the utilitarian view. Um, you know, if you stop guerrilla attacks from happening by doing that, by taking an innocent person in, or at least someone who um, um, who may be innocent, and then executing them, then um, whether they deserve to die or not is irrelevant, and because it stopped something worse from happening. Okay, so and this is an example of uh, exemplary punishment, making an example of someone in order to um, uh, in order to get some benefit some supposed benefit from that the other example is uh, vicarious punishment um, and that is where you harm or punish like the loved ones or the community of the of the person that you are trying to uh, to get to target uh, and you you harm uh, those loved ones in the place of the one that you are actually after. Um, so, you know, these kinds of punishments, um, it's hard to argue from um, what we know of their effectiveness that, you know, that sometimes um, it seems that utilitarianism would morally require um, require us to do those things and that's you know that is gets us into trouble then with uh, issues of justice because <coughs> to do those kinds of things like vicarious punishment or exemplary punishment requires us to commit serious injustices all right so is that then um, um, is that then a correct moral theory if it does require us to commit them all right, so here's the argument. The correct moral theory never requires us to commit serious injustices. Utilitarianism sometimes requires us to commit serious injustices. Therefore, utilitarianism is not the correct moral theory. Um, and the, the issue here, and this gets right to the heart of one of the problems um, that we've, we've talked about earlier, and that is that you know, we have multiple candidates for what is intrinsically valuable. Okay, so for some it would be happiness, uh, or more generally well-being. But what about justice? You know, justice too seems like one of those uh, uh, intrinsically valuable um, ends, and uh, there's something valuable in and of itself. And so that's in fact one of the things that um, the utilitarian will reply. To this argument with, and they'll say, "Hey, yeah, let's let's bring in um, justice as alongside well-being as what needs to be maximized. We have to maximize well-being and justice. Problem solved, right? Well, no, not really, because then you um, come back to the decision pre procedure problem. We don't have a decision procedure, so the, then the question is, when?" Is it you know in a, in an action that is going to promote one value at the expense of the other, and those examples that we just talked about do that, um, and we 
can maximize happiness or we can maximize justice. What happens when you can't do both? Uh, which one do you give the priority to? Okay, so if you always give priority to justice, there will be problems with that. Um, examples will be um, are given in the text. If you give priority to happiness, well, we've already seen what some of the problems are with that. And so, without that decision procedure, utilitarianism seems uh, um, it seems that this reply that justice is also intrinsically valuable is not on the table for the utilitarian. Another reply is that injustice is never optimistic. That if we do our comp computations correctly about, um, you know, what is, what produces the the the, the greatest overall well-being in the world over time, then if we did that correctly, uh, w we would never choose an action that is unjust. Uh, maybe, but um, that seems really optimistic. Um, and again, examples can be brought forward, but um, you know the um, you know t uh, the example of the Sherman uh, that I gave there. The Sherman um, seems to be one that just doesn't work because there you had a terror group, that uh, guerrilla group, um, that. Um, you know, lost its support when um, you know the prisoner of war on their side was simply executed without due process, and we see that also that um, they can lose support when the civilian population that might support them is um, is harmed. Is uh, so it doesn't seem uh, that that is oftentimes it's going to be true, but. It doesn't seem that it's um, it's always going to be true, and we have no we have no real reason to be so optimistic that justice is never uh, that sorry that injustice is never optimistic. Okay, and then uh, another reply is that justice sometimes does simply have to be sacrificed. Um, yet they recognize then that well-being and justice will be in conflict sometimes. Um, and so when they are in conflict, then justice has to take a backseat to well-being. Okay, so that is one possibility is that, you know, it's important to respect people's rights, sure. But if people's rights come up against uh, overall well-being, well, we got to sacrifice people's rights. Okay, so going back to the argument, what that, what that reply is doing is saying that the first premise here that the correct moral theory will never require us to commit serious injustices is uh, false. Okay. Um, okay, so da, 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 let's see what else do I want to say about this. Um, you know, even if uh, um, Um, even if um, I don't want to put this hmm. even if and this is something probably most people would agree with is that there are times when justice uh, can be outweighed by other moral concerns um, then, you know, um, and the examples can be given there. Um, that, um, how do we say it? They wouldn't be exceptions in the in the utilitarian scheme. Um, it would simply be a matter of knowing whether the results are optimistic, um, and so that you know would be potentially a problem. So, you know, suppose, uh, let's do a, an easy rescue example. Okay, so suppose that um, I, ha I could administer CPR to somebody who is uh, suffering a heart attack. Um, 
somebody just right there in front of me, and I could possibly save that person's life. And But in order for me to do that, I have to commit some kind of injustice. Um, I don't know what off the top of my head that would be. Maybe, uh, say, a traffic offense or something like that. Um, that, uh, you know... Um, you know, or or maybe you know, taking away from uh, an appointment that I'm, you know, I'm I would make myself late to an appointment that is uh, that is important, you know, for somebody, um, um, for a good outcome for somebody. Um, so the question then is, um, for the utilitarian, is the justice uh, is to be sacrificed, um, not because of the easy rescue because that's the right thing to do but only if it's only right to do that if the um, result, overall result is optimistic and I don't need then um, I need something to tell me besides utilitarianism when injustice is permitted and when it is not and uh, I I'm stuck with going with an intuition if I if they can't give that to me, and so this would be um, uh, probably a poor example, but I tried to give you an example there of, of uh, what I was um, trying to say with this um, response. Then that um, you know, uh, the problem with always sacrificing justice. Um, sometimes it would be the right thing to do. Other times it would not. Again. A decision procedure is needed. Okay, lastly, we want to talk about rule consequentialism. And remember that uh, act consequentialism is uh, utilitarianism. Rule consequentialism is an action that is morally right just because it's required by an optimistic social rule. So if you remember what we talked about with uh, optimistic uh, in act utilitarianism, it had to do with optimistic results, okay, results of actions. But here we're looking at the social rules, um, and that is one way, another way I should say, that the uh, utilitarian can um, respond to the problem of justice, and the uh, uh, if we take the example of Sherman, you know, shooting the, the captured soldier, um, we, and we want to know, okay, well, wait, was that, the, was that the more acceptable thing to do? According to rule consequentialism, then, if we apply that, we can answer this question by figuring out the moral rules that government, govern the treatment of prisoners of war. So one of those rules would be, hey, you can't execute prisoners uh, without a fair trial. Okay. Um, but another social rule might be, you should execute prisoners of war if you think that doing that will be highly beneficial. Okay, so you can have those those two social rules. You can have other social rules. Okay, so now what the rule consequentialist does is say, okay, now imagine a society that's governed by each of these competing rules. Which society will be better off? All right. Well, of course, that's going to depend on what makes societies and their citizens better off, and of course. There you bring in the, the question of value, right? Hedonism would give you one answer. Desire satisfaction would give you another answer. And then there's all other kinds of objective goods that could be brought in. Autonomy, for example. Okay. So, um, you know, if, if the more that these, uh, uh, these values, intrinsic values can be reduced, the better, the easier, I should say, that it would be easier uh, easier to implement the optimistic social rule because it'll be the one that increases the either the one intrinsic value or maybe two intrinsic values. Okay, um, and so um, we we have to look at if we implement the social rule as a general policy. Um, you know what is. Um, what kind of society is going then to be um, uh, is going to uh, be better off if we implement this uh, 
social rule as a general policy. Okay. All right. So we can use that then in the example of Sherman's um, uh, 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 Sherman's execution of the captive, and then we can solve then the issue of um, of injustice in that case because we can look at okay, well, look. Um, if we maximize happiness and justice, um, I'm sorry. Let me just let me just leave that. Or do I want to leave that? Um, okay. Let's say you want to maximize both happiness and uh, and justice. Okay. And so you, you ask, hey, okay, which are the rules regarding captured prisoners? On the one hand, um, you can't execute them without a fair trial, or you can execute them if doing so will be highly beneficial. Okay, so those two social, which one is going to maximize both happiness and justice? I'm probably going to say the first one, that you can't execute prisoners of war uh, without a fair trial. Okay, so then guess what? That lines up with uh, the requirements of justice. Yay, that's good. Um, and so rule consequentialists would probably condemn Sherman's order to execute the captive. Um, and that aligns then with justice. Uh, you know, most of the time, you know, you'll get, uh, you'll get then, um, uh, you'll get condemnation of actions. You know, when um, when it create when it um, lessens the overall welfare of the society. Okay. Now, the problem that is going to happen here, or the problem that arises as a result is, is we get some we get policies that implement that if implemented, I should say, policies to maximize well-being, great, but what about actions that don't? So you can have, for example, actions that maximize well-being, but, I'm sorry, you have policies that maximize well-being, but then actions that don't do that. Um, and in many cases, just actions will not do that. And so you have then this uh, conflict created and the preference is given to the rule rather than the results. Okay, um, there is uh, finally a concluding section in here um, that goes over this, uh, this problem. Um, the rural consequentialists demand that we obey moral rules even when we know that breaking them would yield better results. And that seems to be irrational given that um, you would knowingly defeat your own goals. Okay, so that's what, that's what happens when rural consequentialism um, says to do a particular action that differs from act utilitarianism and and the example of uh, you know of having the two uh, to the two values of happiness or well-being on the one hand and justice on the other see how that would then um, result how that conflict can arise I should say okay um, so let's see if there's anything else to say about this Okay, <clears throat> um, sorry for the long one, uh, the long video here. This was um, kind of scattered too. My my thoughts were not quite on, uh, uh, quite gathered together for this one. I hope though that it is somewhat useful for you to have gone through um, uh, these these objections and objections, but some of the difficulties at least of uh, consequentialism and that you have a better idea of what you need to know and um, I will see you next time for our um, our next topic is going to be the uh, normative theory of Immanuel Kant <laughs>
Deontological Ethics. And I will see you then to talk about Kant.